welcome to Newsmakers. I'm your host, Lisa Pugh. Representative Greta Neubauer, a 30-year-old Democrat from Racine, is making history as the state's youngest assembly minority leader on record and the first openly LGBTQ leader. She took the helm of her party in January as Representative Gordon Hinn stepped down. She called the most recent assembly session that ended last month a disservice to the people of Wisconsin, and she is praising the redistricting map chosen by the Wisconsin State Supreme Court, saying it puts more Democratic seats in play. She joins us today. Welcome. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. So that legislative session ended in February, and you said in a statement you were deeply disappointed that Republicans put partisan objectives ahead of other interests in Wisconsin. Were there bipartisan ideas, ideas with bipartisan support that should have, could have moved forward in that session? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for this question. You know, there are so many bills that were put forward this session, both by Democrats and in a bipartisan way, that really would have responded to the challenges people in Wisconsin are facing. You know, we still are in a pandemic. Uh, we're hopefully in a new phase of it, but many people continue to struggle. We have significant workforce challenges and rising costs. Um, young people have had a really hard time throughout this pandemic and deserve our support in recovering. So we think there's a lot more that could be done, particularly the governor's special session plan put forward. Um, but a few bipartisan bills I would point to that, you know, really we could have seen action on, um, support uh, to to get rid of the pink tax, that's a tax on diapers and other uh, there items. There was bipartisan support for there that. There was bipartisan support for that. You know, a bill on um, education for teens, on dating violence, bipartisan support on that bill. I point to both of those as we're here in Women's History Month, right? There are so many bills that we could have addressed this session um, that had bipartisan support, but unfortunately, most of those did not move forward. You mentioned at the end of the session the absentee ballots as well. Is that another area where we really should have had bipartisan support? Just clarify which bill you Absentee mean. ballots and how they were counted and the oh, timeline sure, for Monday. counting. Yeah, so there was discussion at the end of session about the ability for clerks to vote, to start counting those absentee ballots Monday before a Tuesday election. That was something that we wanted to work with Republicans on. There were some discussions there, but unfortunately, we, we couldn't come to an agreement about a clean bill that really just addressed that one issue. Um, unfortunately, Republicans insisted on putting other pieces into that bill that, that our members couldn't get behind. Shortly after the legislative session ended, Republicans then rejected Governor Evers' proposal for a $150 per person tax refund mm -hmm in Wisconsin facing that record surplus, healthy rainy day fund, all of those indicators. The governor said made it a good client for that. Yeah. We sat down recently with Representative Steineke and he said, we need permanent tax reform. Uh, do you support, why do you think that Democrats and Republicans can't come to agreement on tax refunds? Yeah, well, what I would say to start is, if Republicans want to sit down with us and have that conversation, we are always willing. Um, unfortunately, as, as you mentioned, we've got this significant surplus, $3.8 billion, and really what we've heard from Republicans repeatedly is that they're not interested in taking action on that in the near term. That's while Wisconsinites are facing rising costs at the gas pump, at the grocery store. If if Republicans want to have a serious conversation about where that money goes, we're always willing to have that. Um, but we think that needs to happen now and not wait until the next budget session, budget cycle or, or session. Um, the governor put forward the proposal for $150 per person, $600 for a family of four. Does that solve some of our longer term problems? It doesn't get to the root of it, maybe, but it matters now, and it matters when people are going literally to the gas station and, and having to face those costs. So we do hope that we can take action sooner rather than later on those issues facing Wisconsinites. We're going to show a quick clip of you on March 8th, right before that special session was gaveled in and out by Republicans. And I realize that the impacts of climate we must act now to support our kids and our schools and give them the necessary resources. This legislative session has been riddled with missed opportunities for the legislature to come together and address the real issues facing Wisconsinites. And we cannot let today be another missed opportunity. We as a legislative body can and must work together 
to address rising costs, to make sure folks can afford to join our workforce, and to do what's best for our kids. This is the people's money. Let's get it back to them. So this issue of a tax refund seems to be a flip-flop for either party depending on who's proposing it. Representative Steineke said $150 isn't going to go very far. Is that, is that true, that this is really a political football sort of conversation? Well, we do think the context is really important. Again, with the inflation that we're seeing, when I'm in my district, when I'm talking to folks, again, at the grocery store or when our members are in, in their communities around the state, they are hearing from people about the impacts of inflation, right? It is a real problem that Wisconsinites are facing. And so I do think that calls for action from the legislature right now. You know, over the course of the pandemic, unfortunately, the majority party, the Republican leadership in the Senate and Assembly, um, really did not come to the table to address many of those urgent issues folks were facing over the course of the pandemic while we were ready to come in and, and address those challenges. Um, we think the same situation applies. Uh, when the people of Wisconsin are feeling the impacts of um, local or, or national events, we should be addressing them. We should at the very least be coming to the table and debating them. So to have Republicans gavel in and out of that special session without a vote or a discussion of alternative proposals was very disappointing. You, you talked about in that clip and you've talked about during your time in the legislature about the importance of funding for schools yeah. in your district. Racine Unified School District in the most recent state report card got two stars, meets few expectations. And really even before the pandemic, the scores for that school district weren't getting any better. In fact, were getting worse. Does more funding for that school system actually fix those problems? We believe that it does. So my family has been in Racine for a long time. Um, my dad tells me about how when he was young and was going to Racine Public Schools, they were known statewide for being some of the best schools in Wisconsin. People moved to Racine for our school district. Um, as you mentioned, we have struggled in recent years, and I really do attribute that to the consistent underfunding of schools at the state level. You can look back many years at, at those records, those receipts are there. Um, there's a lot that we need to do to be investing in our young people, but we know that if kids do not have the resources they need to get the support to be successful in school, our whole state is going to struggle. You know, as the governor says, what's best for our kids is what's best for our state, and I really do believe that to be true. Um, you know, in visiting our schools recently in Racine and, and seeing uh, other parts of the state as well, we know that Wisconsinites want that investment in our schools. They want to make sure that kids have the mental health supports they need to recover from a very trying two years of the pandemic. They want to see special education reimbursement rates raised in Wisconsin to make sure that um, all kids are getting the support that they need to succeed in school. And I believe our job in the legislature is to respond to what the people of Wisconsin are asking us for, and that very clearly is more more support for our schools. Some point to the performance of the Racine Parental Choice Program, mm -hmm. that the scores of the students there, the ratings of those schools are higher than Racine Unified, and the Choice Program, in some ways, those kids are doing better, and that's the justification for expanding that voucher program statewide. How do you respond to that? I think we need to really be making sure that every kid in the state has an opportunity for a good education. And having pulling some kids out of public schools, sending them to other schools is not going to address that problem. Um, it's, it's not getting to the root of the issue. So my hope is that we can recognize that for every kid to have an equal opportunity, no matter what they look like or what zip code they live in, we need to be making our public schools um, successful. We need to be giving teachers the resources they need. We need to be listening again to those students and parents who are saying that, um, that, that they're frustrated that the state has not been keeping its commitment to our local districts. So I do think funding is critical. And of course, I fully support the efforts going on in Racine and in many other parts of the state to make sure that we are teaching kids the skills they need to enter the workforce to be successful in their lives. We've got some great programs going on in Racine. I'd point to particularly our academies program, 
which really supports young people with apprenticeships and career development. You know, there's a lot of good things going on, um, and it's up to the state to make sure that our districts can continue with that innovation and supporting kids uh, in the ways that they need. Moving on to a different topic, uh, when we talked to the Assembly Majority Leader Steineke, he pointed to the bipartisan law enforcement reforms that came out of the Speaker's Task Force on mm -hmm. Racial Disparities, which you know tackled issues like chokeholds and use of force and no-knock warrants, some really difficult issues in the wake of the Jacob Blake shooting mm -hmm. in Kenosha, the George Floyd murder by a police officer. Are you satisfied with the outcome of that law enforcement reform work? We're not. Um, unfortunately, a number of those bills just did not get at the root of what we see as some of those challenges. Um, for example, a number of those bills had provisions that were things that many districts around the state, including Racine, were, were already looking into or had already implemented. Um, we think that there's more work to do to ensure that there's transparency and accountability with law enforcement and that we're making the kind of investments at the state level that not only respond to crime but also reduce crime. Um, and what I would point to first and foremost in that regard is that is our shared revenue payments, right? This is our local government funding that for years has been um, stagnant from the state. If we want to have healthy communities, communities that are safe, where everyone can feel safe and supported in their community, we need to make sure we have investments in mental health funding. We need to make sure that we are um, able to build up the kind of infrastructure that communities need to reduce crime in the first place. So that's really the kind of policy that we are we're focused on um, and want to make sure that communities have that long-term investment they need to make the best decisions for uh, safety in their community. Given the environment there we're in and the partisan nature of the legislature, was that about as much progress as you were going to make at a first pass on those is issues? Well, it's always hard to say. <laughs> um, you know, I always, I always come to work believing that we can do more, is what I will say. And, you know, I do appreciate that there was a conversation in the Capitol on, on some of these issues um, and that there, you know, was work uh, put in by both sides. But ultimately, I just don't think that there was the kind of compromise and um, bipartisan work that we need to see, to see on those issues. Speaking of partisanship in the legislature, some people think that the way that the redistricting maps are drawn really contribute to that hyper-partisan nature of what happens and what can get done in the legislature. You have, as we said in the opening, praised the maps that the state Supreme Court ultimately chose, Governor Evers' uh, proposed maps. You said it puts 10 more assembly districts in play for Democrats. Is it a fair map? Mm. No, unfortunately. Um, we know that for a map to be truly fair and nonpartisan, it shouldn't be drawn by politicians, which is why we have over several years put forward a proposal for a nonpartisan redistricting committee. Um, unfortunately, that has not moved forward in the Republican-controlled legislature, but we will certainly continue fighting for that. You know, given that that bill did not move forward, given that the Supreme Court imposed a uh, lease change principle for parties submitting potential maps to follow, we are pleased that they chose the governor's map. We think that this best reflects the will of the people in Wisconsin in that it does uh, contribute to competitiveness in a number of seats, which is a good thing. You know, it's not a good thing to have uh, a seat like mine where really it would be very hard for a Republican to compete. I think it would be great if every cycle I was in a competitive race, and that was true for folks around the state. Now, it won't be true in every seat because some communities are, are just a little more red or a little more blue, but I do hope that um, the, with these new maps, we'll be able to have more competitive seats. Um, we're excited about that, and we hope that that will result in the will of the people better being reflected in the Capitol. The Republicans have been challenging that decision, as you know, calling uh, it a racially gerrymandered map, mm -hmm. and they are talking about seven black majority districts. Are there some concerns with the way those districts were dr drawn and kind of how race is represented in our maps? Yeah, it's a good question, and I'll be honest, I'm not a redistricting <laughs> expert, right, and I, I didn't draw those maps. But what I'll say is that, um, you know, in speaking to members of our caucus, there will always 
be uh, a really crucial and important focus on making sure that we are protecting the voting rights of black and brown Wisconsinites. That is crucial in our state. Um, there is always more work to do for us to better reflect the people of Wisconsin in the legislature. That includes women, that includes people of color, and, and many other underrepresented groups. Um, but we are feeling that these maps are, are a strong uh, place for us to move forward in terms of having better representation in the Capitol. As you know, Assembly Speaker Voss recently continued the Gableman uh, contracts, uh, Supre former Supreme Court Justice Gableman and his investigation into the 2020 election. You and your colleagues have said it needs to end. Republicans have said we need to close some loops here in order to restore trust in elections, that that's at its core what this investigation is about. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to that? Do, do people need more trust in Wisconsin elections? Yeah, so I think what I would start by saying is that the primary reason that people have concerns about our elections in Wisconsin is because Republicans have been sowing misinformation and distrust in our elections since particularly the last election, but before that as well. Um, Republicans are using the very misinformation that they sowed to then justify this further investigation by Michael Gableman. Um, what we believe we need to do is we need to lift up the nonpartisan uh, efforts that have looked into the election and said things were, things were fair. This election was won by Joe Biden. This election was clearly won by Joe Biden. And now we need to look forward. You know, when we talk to people around Wisconsin, they are not um, focused on the last election. They're focused on the issues that are impacting them and their families right now. And instead of, again, coming into the Capitol and working on those really kitchen table issues Wisconsinites are facing, Republicans are continuing to, um, to chase the big lie. They're continuing to empower Michael Gableman, who has said the legislature should continue to look into decertifying the 2020 election, which has been uh, you know, declared by nonpartisan lawyers to be unconstitutional, as well as members of Republican leadership. And so it's very frustrating that Republicans are continuing to, um, to again, sort of chase, chase this lie. And so this distrust that I think will have significant long-term ramifications in whether or not people have faith in our democratic system. Another thing that comes up in that investigation that a lot of people have been talking about is this the role of private money mm -hmm. in supporting election administration. And specifically, the Republicans call this the sucker bucks or mm -hmm. money from a foundation supported by Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook. Racine received about $1.7 million in that private money. You could argue that the pandemic caused increased costs should private money continue to be accessible to communities to help them with that election administration? Yeah, it's a great question. So when this bill came up on the floor, what we introduced as an amendment was an alternative that said, we need to fully fund our local elections. And that's where we stand on this issue. It is crucial that everyone has the ability to participate in our democratic system, regardless of whether or not we're in the middle of a global pandemic. And so what we would like to see happen is full state funding for our elections. And if that doesn't happen, then private money should be available? If that doesn't happen, then local governments, I believe, should be able to do um, what they can to make sure that they're able to fully fund their elections and ensure the right to vote for all their citizens. Do you feel the same about that issue if it's money coming from a conservative foundation, you know, the Koch brothers or some other source to kind of get out the vote on the other side of the aisle? Yeah, I mean, as long as it's going towards nonpartisan work, right? And that's the crucial piece of this, is that money was going towards election administration. It was not going towards work that was partisan in nature. Um, we should all want more people to participate in our elections. And so our first and foremost goal, again, is make sure that everyone has the ability to participate in our elections. And we hope to accomplish that through, again, that adequate funding of local governments. Another issue that you've been a leader on in your time in the legislature and even before that is climate change. We want to show a clip of you introducing a set of bills last fall. 
And I realized that the impacts of climate change were going to multiply and that all of our lives would be fundamentally shaped by this crisis. That many people's lives, especially low-income people and people of color, were already feeling the impacts. I can still feel the fear rising in my stomach as I realized how serious the climate crisis is and how ill-prepared we were to address it. The reason I'm here 10 years later is because every generation from here on out will live in a world fundamentally defined by climate change. It is a truth no longer seriously debated. The only question that remains is what we are going to do about it. We have no time to waste if we want to give young people a fighting chance. So ultimately that set of bills didn't go anywhere. What's your plan now to get more bipartisan support for climate change issues? Yeah, yeah. So before I ran for office, I was an organizer. I was working with young people on the issue of climate change. And when I ran for office, I knew the climate, the partisan climate I was coming into in the Capitol, that unfortunately it's pretty hard for us to move forward bills if there's a Democrat's name on them right now. Um, the way I think we move forward from this is that we continue to build public support and public pressure on folks in the Capitol. You know, the conversation about climate change that happens in the Capitol is really different than the conversation that Wisconsinites are having about this issue. You know, through the governor's task force on climate change led by Lieutenant Governor Barnes, which I was a member of, we talked to a lot of people about the ways that climate change was impacting them already. And those folks spanned from farmers to people in my community of Racine who like to walk along the shoreline, which is eroding. Um, we talked to folks who lived you know, near coal plants and experienced uh, the air quality impacts of that. There are so many ways in which the transition to a green and sustainable economy will help Wisconsin. It will create good new jobs. It will reduce long-standing inequities, particularly racial inequities. So we know that the public is there on these issues and that urgency is building. And so our role is to make sure that that voice comes into the Capitol and that we continue to put pressure on our colleagues and to work with them whenever possible to find those solutions that do address the problems that people in Wisconsin are, are facing. So this is not a radical climate change agenda. It's not pandering to a liberal fringe base as, as has been said. <laughs> no, it's not. You know, it really was built out of the governor's task force on climate change. And the members of that task force spanned from Republican legislators to industry leaders to farmers. You know, we had folks from every corner of the state. We had people from many different backgrounds, including people who for far too long have not been part of the conversation, but have been particularly impacted by the, um, by the impacts of climate change, including people of color and native Wisconsinites. So if the solutions are coming out of a group of folks who really is very representative of the state, and we're taking that public input, and we're turning those ideas into policy, I feel I feel that it's really reflective, you know, of the people You're of Wisconsin. Progress this next session. I am, I am, and um, you know, the capital is is sometimes difficult, and again, it doesn't always reflect the will of the people. But I do feel the conversation changing significantly around climate change. I've been doing this work for about ten years personally, and we have made significant progress. If not in the Wisconsin legislature, you know, in um, in state houses around the country and in Washington in terms of recognizing the urgency of this issue and again recognizing that it really does present an opportunity for us to increase our quality of life here in Wisconsin to have the kind of jobs Wisconsinites want to stay here for and move here for um, and to decrease those long-standing inequities. So uh, we mentioned in the introduction you're the youngest assembly minority leader in the, the record of records <laughs> in Wisconsin. You're also the first openly LGBTQ leader in the state. And we're going to look at some statistics uh, nationally. LGBTQ elected officials increased by 17% with 1980, uh, 986 currently serving. That's the change between 2020 and 2021. That's a 121% increase since they first started kind of taking records on this. Why do you think it's important to have 
a leader and voices that are from the LGBTQ community in the legislature? Yeah, thank you for that question. So, um, you know, when I first ran for office, which was about four years ago, I actually didn't talk about this part of my identity. I sort of felt like it was a little personal and, you know, it's, it's a vulnerable thing to kind of get into those personal parts of yourself. But over the course of my time serving, I met a lot of young people in Racine, and I learned of um, challenges that young people were having in schools, um, violence that LGBTQ youth had faced in Racine, and it really became very clear to me that it was really important for people in leadership positions to talk about this. And I had a really amazing experience of, of writing an op-ed, I think it was coming on two years ago now, and having people from Racine reach out to me and say, you know, I didn't know this about you, or I've never actually met someone, you know, who identified in this way, and kind of asking me questions. And what I like to think is hopefully, you know, those folks, many of them older in Racine, had grandkids, right, who may at some point be coming out to them. And they'll be able to have a different conversation about that because it won't be the first conversation, right? Um, of course, we've also seen a number of bills come up in the legislature this cycle particularly targeting trans young people. And um, I think it's crucially important that people um, understand the challenges that trans youth face, particularly mental health challenges. Um, my sister, my younger sister is a trans woman, so it's an issue that is really personal to me as well. Um, and Are I- Are you bringing more issues like this, intersectionality issues into the into the agenda of the Assembly Democrats then? Yeah, I mean, members have been doing a great job, um, you know, representing on these issues, but of course our LGBTQ caucus continues to grow in the legislature, and I think having that actual representation is crucial. We're really, you know, we're proud of our diversity in the Democratic Assembly Caucus in many ways, our uh, first female majority caucus, and um, uh, more people of color, and uh, so, so many other forms of diversity. So we're really excited about that, and also know that um, we have more work to do in the legislature as a whole. What are your top three priorities for the Assembly Democratic agenda? Yeah, so, uh, it's always hard to narrow down to three. <laughs> um, we have a time li limit on our programs. So. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I think um, what I would say first is, again, we just heard from so many people over the course of the pandemic that we're, we're having a hard time. We're struggling in, in many ways. And so I think economic security will, will be number one there. You know, we are seeing the economy recovering, but not everybody has a piece of that pie right now. So that will always be, um, you know, right at the top of the list for us is making sure that everybody can afford to save for retirement, you know, go on a few vacations, send their kids to college. These are the things that Wisconsinites want and that Wisconsinites deserve. And so that will, that will be a top priority for us in the, in the Assembly Democratic Caucus. Um, we talked a fair bit about education, but we do feel that, you know, from kindergarten through, uh, uh, an apprenticeship or a uh, higher education opportunity. Wisconsinites want the opportunity to do work that is meaningful. They want to be able to make ends meet. Um, and the way that we can help them do that is we can make sure they have a strong start. And so all the way, again, from, from child care on up, we need to make sure those opportunities are available. And I think the third thing I would mention is, is health care. You know, if this pandemic taught us anything, I think it's that our well-being is linked that having a trusting relationship with a doctor is, is crucial. And so we will continue to fight for greater healthcare access for everyone, um, regardless of your income. And that is something that I think Wisconsinites deserve from the legislature. Okay, thank you for that summary and good luck to you in the upcoming session. Thank you so much. And thank you to the viewers of Newsmakers. Be sure to tune in again and like our program. Thank you for watching. This program is a production of Wisconsin Eye, an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit media network with a mission to inform, educate, and engage the citizens of Wisconsin. Wisconsin Eye is the nation's first and only independently funded state civic broadcast network, providing gavel to gavel access to government proceedings and events at the state capitol.
As Wisconsin Eye enters its 15th year covering Wisconsin politics and civic life throughout the state, we ask that you support our upcoming campaign 2022 coverage as we follow the races for State Assembly and Senate, Governor, U.S. Senate, and Congress. Help Wisconsin and I reach our goal of raising $30,000 by making a tax-deductible donation today by going to wisi.org slash donate or by texting WISI to 44321. Your donation will ensure that Wisconsin and I can continue to be your top source for campaign 2022 coverage.